everybody. Uh, my name is Charlie Culpepper. I'm a biological administrator with the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, Division of Aquaculture. We really appreciate everybody being here today and all the folks that are attending online. I'm just going to give some quick uh, run through the agenda real quick and we'll jump into our sessions. Uh, we appreciate everybody being here. This uh, workshop was put together by the Division of Aquaculture with our collaborators at NOAA Marine Debris Program. Uh, National Marine Sanctuaries Foundation gave us funding for this to get our uh, guest speakers here. We appreciate their support as well. So this is a, really a, a special workshop. Uh, the shellfish aquaculture industry is really a, a win-win from environmental and an economic perspective. And uh, we appreciate everybody being here to talk about this kind of big picture uh, management problem. And we hope that this is a, these panel sessions that we're gonna have in the workshop to be an informal uh, uh, audience discussion and uh, really hopefully get some good information and uh, usable information for the farmers out there in terms of managing gear. So uh, I'm giving the opening remarks and then we've got some uh, special guests from Senator uh, Bill Nelson and Con Congressman Neil Dunn will be here as well to give some opening remarks right when I get done. Uh, Charles Grisafi is gonna talk about the NOAA Marine Debris Program and give us an overview of all the work that they do nationally. Then I'm gonna talk real quick about our shellfish BMPs, our best management practices here in Florida. And we'll just give a quick review of what those regulations are and so we can keep those in mind as we move into the panel sessions. So we'll, uh, Dr. Bill Walton's here. He's gonna lead our oyster gear management panel and we have some uh, volunteer uh, farmer participants that have traveled all the way here to talk about their personal experiences. And the same thing goes for uh, Leslie Sturmer. We'll be leading the clam gear management panel and we'll have an open discussion about uh, some different topics with gear. So uh, Bob Ralt of the East Coast Shellfish Growers Association has traveled all the way down from New England to be with us today. He's going to give us a talk from the association's perspective about lease stewardship and, and public perception of the industry. And then uh, our, uh, our Department of Agriculture staff here, uh, Mark, is, is going to give us a, just a review of the recent marine debris survey that was conducted in Cedar Key. And then uh, Cedar Key Aquaculture Association members are going to come up and lead an organization in discussion about the cleanup event that's going to be happening this Saturday on International Coastal Cleanup Day. So just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, there is a sign up sheet in the back of the room. Uh, if everybody can remember, please silence your cell phones if you can. Uh, the bathrooms you'll find on the right side of the building, over, it'll be your left side that way. So if you need to use the restroom, they're available over there. Uh, for our folks online, if you're interested in receiving follow-up information, uh, just like the folks in the room, if you sign up, I'm gonna produce a summary of uh, information that we're gonna produce from this workshop. and. If you just send me an email there, I'll uh, get that information out to you. All right, so that's all I have. So, yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Got it. Oh, well, certainly got to have them here. So, all right. So, uh, at, at this time, we'll have some opening remarks. Uh, Ms. Marshall, are you ready? Okay. <laughs> Hey y'all, good afternoon. My name's Lisa Marshall, I'm with Senator Nelson's office. Um, I, I always enjoy coming out to Cedar Key. I'm his regional director covering North Central Florida, which is basically the I-75 corridor from Hamilton County down to Pinellas. Um, and of course, Cedar Key is one of my favorite places. I love Tony's Seafood. And um, unfortunately, the Senator couldn't be with 
y'all today. But um, I did want to just share a few things with you all on behalf of Senator Nelson. Of course, thank you to NOAA and to FDAX um, for being a part of this and all that you do for the community here. Um, but also to the growers and for all you're doing to keep uh, Cedar Keys clam fishery booming. Now, I know that I don't have to tell y'all around here that environment is a way of life. Um, historically, it was oysters and finfin, right? Finfish. Um, and when those industries got shut down, Cedar Keys fishermen did not throw in the towel here, right? Um, but you threw in some broodstock. And so with some elbow grease, science, and partnership with UF, IFAS, and um, with the NOAA Sea Grant, which of course we, we love to support, um, you've successfully kept um, this waterfront working and providing a quality way of life. Um, now, I've already told you I love Tony's, but um, those delicious little little necks need clean water to thrive and grow. You all know this. And Senator Nelson will continue to work tirelessly with his colleagues across the aisle. And I'm also glad to see that Senator Rubio's staff is here. Um, and the Capitol to ensure that we have a healthy environment. Most of you know that Senator Nelson is the ranking member of the Senate Commerce Committee and has oversight of NOAA. Um, and he's been a strong supporter of the Sea Grant and the Marine Debris Program. I know you're all on the front lines of environmental leadership here, um, and I know that you care about the future of beautiful Cedar Key. You care about your product. And so, um, as always, we are honored to participate in workshops here and learn about strategies that we can keep the ocean clean. And so, from the bottom of my heart, and thank you for inviting us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Marshall. Mr. Kendrick here. Okay. Okay, well, we'll go ahead and just move forward then with uh, our NOAA Marine Debris Program review. So hi everybody, my name is Demi Fox. I am Charles's counterpart but for our Northeast region. So I have Maine, New Hampshire, Mass, Connecticut, and Rhode Island, and I am taking notes for you guys today. Verners Ray, clam farmer. Garrett Warren, clam farmer. Jamie Latender with DEP's Big Ben Seagrasses Aquatic Preserve um, here for the manager, Tim Jones. Trisha Green here with Jamie for Tim Jones. Reed Tilly, oyster farmer. Heath Davis, Cedar Key. Christopher Topping, Clamtastic Seafood Cedar Key farmer. Leslie Sturmer, UF IFAS, Cedar Key. John Burney, Clam Farmer. Uh, Bill Walton here from uh, Auburn University and Mississippi, Alabama Sea Grant. Rich Malinowski with the National Marine Fishery Service, St. Petersburg Regional Office. Lisa with Senator Nelson's office. Ashley Cook with Senator Rubio's office. Uh, Barry Hurt, Shelf uh, Clam Farmer. Keith Taft, oyster farmer. Dwayne, clam farmer. Dana Bethay, NOAA National Marine Fisheries, uh, St. Pete Regional Office. Jess Vick Snippert, Regional Coordinator, uh, Regional Aquaculture Coordinator for the NOAA Fisheries Southeast Regional Office. There are other folks. Sue Colson, Cedar Key. Rose Cantwell, Cedar Key, Wholesaler, and Cedar Key. 
Pat Mariano, aquaculture biologist. Jeff Tilly, oyster boss from Apalachicola. Mark Behaven with FDAC Fish and Aquaculture here in Cedar Key. Portia Sapp, FDAC Aquaculture. Bob Rowe, East Coast Shellfish Grower. Uh, Charlie Culpepper, Department of Agriculture Division of Aquaculture. I'm Natalie Simon, UFIFA Cedar Key, and today we actually have 12 people online zooming in. Listening, so. <laughs> Good. I'm Charles Rosafi. I'm with the NOAA Marine Debris Program. I'm the Florida and Caribbean Region Coordinator. Uh, Caribbean being U.S. Caribbean and Puerto Rico. Uh, and I'm just going to give an overview of the NOAA Marine Debris Program. A little bit of here in Florida. Um, so what is marine debris? Um, marine debris is that any solid man-made material that is directly, indirectly, intentionally disposed or unintentionally abandoned that makes its way into a marine environment. Marine debris is not vegetative debris. We get that question all the time, so it's man-made. And it's everything from micro debris, so micro bead right there, to large scale infrastructure debris, um, vessels, piers, docks, after storms, and of course, aquaculture and fishing gear. Sources of marine debris, we break it down into two categories, ocean-based and land-based. So your ocean-based, you're gonna see commercial and recreational fishing, um, offshore oil and gas, stuff from cargo ships, and then abandoned and derelict vessels, which is a big issue in, in Florida. Um, Land-based, you're gonna see more of your consumer debris, your plastic, single-use plastic, littering, stuff from solid waste management, stuff that's transported from um, stormwater systems, and then your extreme weather events. This is a hot topic right now, so I figured I'd do it for a slide about plastic pollution. Um, so there's been eight, Billion, billion, sorry, billion tons of plastic manufactured since 1950. And I don't think people know that less than 10% of that has been recycled. So another 10% is 30% is still in use, but 60% of that 8 billion tons has either made it into the landfill or the water. And you can see the trend. Um, this one. Just since 1950, just the generation of plastic and the amount discarded. Most of it is coming from Asia. Impacts of marine debris. Um, you hear about ingestion of animals eating plastic or other debris, um, entanglement in ghost fishing, issues of marine life getting caught in discarded fishing gear or lost gear or traps that were lost due to fish that's known as ghost fish that commercial product um hazards to navigation marine debris gets caught or impacts the vessels um, stuff that people may forget or not think about is causes habitat damage mothering of seagrasses um banging in and disrupting coral reefs um, and then in non-native species transport so we saw this with the Japan tsunami. We were getting debris washing up on the west coast of the United States in Oregon, Washington, California, and it was carrying tons of invasive species from Asia. So that's another issue that's up and coming that needs to be looked at. And then, of course, the economic cost of marine debris, the cost to cities or counties to clean up debris, um, keep beaches clean, and then cost to fishermen or um, farmers for the loss of gear and having to replace that or the loss of product. I wanted to highlight just the ghost fishing issue. Um, so every year, thousands of fishing traps and nets are abandoned in the US. Um, and we have data and research to show that that's impacting a wide spectrum of species, including endangered and threatened species. Um, we did a recent study the, uh, in 2014, I believe the study was done, and we found that there were over 85,000 active, so that means traps in the Keys that are still fishing um, that were lost. So you can imagine the amount of 
commercial product that's lost because of that. That picture right there is um, from Georgia. It was a lost crab trap, crab pot, and they found uh, 94 dead terrapins just in that one pot. So to help address this issue, Congress um, in 2006 passed the Marine Debris Act, which created the No Marine Debris Program. Um, so we're still a fairly young program. Uh, and our vision is to the global ocean and its coast free from the impacts of marine debris. Ambitious vision, but hey. Um, and we get this question all the time. The Marine Debris Program is not in the National Marine Fishery Service. It's in the National or Ocean Service under um, the Office of Response and Restoration. Um, we have five, uh, sorry, we have multiple legislative mandates through the Marine Debris Act, um, and those are listed up there. Identify, determine sources of, assess, prevent, reduce, and remove marine debris, um, provide national and regional coordination, reduce the adverse impacts of loss and discarded fishing gear, conduct education and outreach, and then more recently, um, it was added in 2012, address severe marine debris events, so that's natural disasters and the debris associated with them. To address our legislative mandates, we have five program pillars, um, removal, prevention, research, emergency response, and regional coordination. I'll quickly go through each of those. Um, removal, we have, we fund, we have a grant competition every year um, where we fund community-based marine debris removal projects, typically 10 to 12 projects throughout the country. Um, and each year we have different priorities of what we want to see grant applications um, submitted as. Um, and removal priorities include derelict fishing gear. Aquaculture gear was just added last year as a um, priority for this competition. So our current FFO for removal is out right now. So I encourage people to take a look at that, um, especially for aquaculture gear priority, abandoned and derelict vessels, um, debris from natural disasters, and then debris uh, in critical habitats is a, a priority for NOAA. Prevention, similar to removal, we do a competition every other year for prevention grants, and that's typically fund 10 to 12 projects per year throughout the country. And our priorities are education and outreach uh, for students K through 12 in college. Um, outreach with fishing communities, the coastal tourism industry, um, stormwater and solid waste management, and then single use plastic reduction. Am I good on time? Uh, I'll quickly go through this. Research competition we have every other year. Um, we fund projects, joint projects with state agencies and academia. Um, and those are our research priorities, microplastics, fishing gear assessment and modification, economic impacts of marine debris, the plastic and chemical impacts on wildlife, and then ultimately human health, because we're eating that wildlife, and then detection methods. Emergency response, um, we provide, we create emergency response plans for each coastal state that just helps states pre prepare for marine debris problem after natural disaster. So it just highlights what agency is responsible and different funding mechanisms to get debris removed. We also support um, lead agencies in the actual response. So we could go to um, joint field offices or incident command posts to help the Coast Guard or EPA or the Army Corps um, during a disaster re recovery and response. Um, due to time, I just wanna highlight one thing here. Um, after Hurricane Irma hit uh, Florida last year, we were given supplemental funding from Congress, so thank you. Uh, 18 million for marine debris removal. Um, and there's one project that's gonna be done, um, aquaculture through the supplemental funding, where we're gonna, um, FDAX is gonna assess, remove, and dispose of marine debris in aquaculture use zones, and then also provide convenient disposal options for farmers um, with different dumpsters in this area. Regional coordination, there's me, on all these different places around the country. Um, yeah, two minutes. Okay. Um, question? Or is that in my No. <laughs> it's not stuck in Congress. <laughs> 
That's a question I get all the time, so I can, it's a very convoluted answer, so I don't want to waste everyone's time in the weeds there. Yeah. Can we just wait till the end of the, yeah, 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 we'll just, oh, that's a problem. So part of our national coordination is we develop action plans or reduction plans with East Coastal State to reduce marine debris and how. Um, we could do that together with different partners. Um, and the reduction plan was released in January of 2017 for Florida. Um, it's, it was a result of multiple years of collaboration between governments, industry, and academia. Um, the plan is a coordinated message on how we want to address marine debris for different topics in the state. Um, it helps, it's been helping us as a guide to measure implementation. So how effective are, are we at reducing marine debris and how effective are we at implementing strategies and actions highlighted in the plan. And then finally, it helps NOAA prioritize projects for funding. The plan has five goals. Um, and the specific goals are to reduce consumer debris, so your single use plastics, reduce the amount of derelict fishing gear, which includes aquaculture gear, reduce the amount of abandoned derelict vessels, increase the capacity to respond to emergency debris and then reduce the impacts on habitat and wildlife. I won't go into all these goals, but I did wanna highlight um, the implementation of this plan, and then I'll talk briefly about the fishing gear. Um, there's five working groups based on the five goals of the plan. So we have a working group for derelict fishing gear, and each working group has a representative from NOAA, DEP, and FWC that help facilitate and coordinate implementation. So we're always encouraging more people to join these working groups. So if you have an interest in joining the Derelict Fishing Gear Working Group for the purposes of aquaculture, let me or Charlie know and we'll get you added to that, that working group. Um, and here's the Derelict Fishing Goal. So it's goal two in the plan and it has four solutions. We wanna conduct education and outreach to in just an increase overall awareness of Derelict Fishing Gear issue and that's with the general public and recreational and commercial fishermen. We want to assess best, practice, best practices and gear design to minimize loss and impact. So that's studies to change gear design of fishing gear, biodegradable panels, uh, coal rings, stuff like that. Increased options for disposal and recycling of unwanted gear. I know that's a huge issue here. Um, and then finally, improve mechanisms to report and process derelict fishing gear. These are the objectives related to aquaculture in the plan. Um, and FDAX has been amazing and been a, honestly a leader in the country on aquaculture debris issues. Um, and a lot of these are in the process of already being worked on or already been completed. Um, so if you have any ideas on how you can help us implement these, please, we, we, we wanna hear them. Um, I won't go through all of them for the sake of time, but if you want a copy of those, I can provide it with you. These are just some of the initiatives that we do under this goal. A lot of trap retrieval, a lot of monofilament recovery, and then DAX, like I said, leading it uh, on aquaculture. Uh, finally, we're gonna have a workshop early next year to revise and really improve upon the plan um, based on what we've learned the past few years. So here's the save the date. It's gonna be in South Florida in the Fort Lauderdale area. Uh, we encourage people to join that workshop. And then here's my contact information. If you have any follow-up questions, um, I could take some now, but if you have any that you want to reach out to me. If you have, if you have questions, I'm just going to pass the mic around. So my question is, um, you know, we're pretty good at cleaning up marine debris, but we're not real good at writing grants. So I've looked into your program, or our group has, and it just seems very like a, a daunting task to try to really apply for it. Do you guys have help within your agency that would help us, you know, put a grant together? Absolutely. Um, I can help you um, work through that process. I can't write it for you, but I can definitely help you um, 
with ideas and trying to go guide you through that tedious process. But yes, please feel free to outreach to me and you can do that. A lot of, a lot of other people do. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the um, emergency response pillar or whatever. Yes. Uh, I'm very interested in that, um, especially being ready. Our city is very ready with emergency issues for hurricanes preparedness. We have great plans. We implement them immediately, and it just goes right into effect. Um, is each area going to have an emergency plan? Because our area would be different than another area. And how could we get our plan started? Because I would envision that if we had a direct hit of a storm, we would have marine debris in, in, in excess for, because of the aquaculture gear, and we need help then. And we'd have to have our plan. Plans are no good after it happens. You have to have it ready before, and you would have to know who does what. So uh, how do we get in that fold? Or are you just talking about it and it hasn't even happened no, yet? No, no, that plan exists for Florida. It's more of an overview of jurisdictions on after a storm. Well, give us our part for our part yes, there's afterwards. A area. There's a local Yeah, because we need to be involved in that because obviously we didn't know about it. So your plan may be there, but it isn't helping us locally. Yeah, and we encourage so that. So I would, I would encourage you to reach out to us for that information. Sure, I'll be glad to Thank share you. that with you. I just wanted to remind folks that, um, you know, obviously we are familiar with knowing the grant process and on the Senator's website, which is billnelson.senate.gov, um, there is a section that talks about um, grant letters of support and grant research. Um, and we do have staff that helps with some of that. Like NOAA, we don't write grants, um, but we also can offer some assistance. And we often um, tell folks that if, especially in some of our littler cities and communities, uh, the local colleges are a good resource um, for the agencies, whether it's a nonprofit or the city or the municip municipality, um, to get folks to help to write the grants. And I'm available if anybody needs any of that additional information as well. That's a good point. So that if you have partners with your grant, that makes that a more competitive grant as well. So you can pull in partners to help write portions of a, a grant. Any other questions? All right, thank you. All right. We really appreciate all the support of NOAA's Marine Debris Program. They've been excellent. Um, Plastic pollution is truly a, a global crisis. It's a big problem, as you can see from uh, Charles's presentation. Um, and it's unlike all the other, a lot of other aquaculture that occurs on private land, shellfish aquaculture does happen in the commons or in, in public water. So it's important for the longevity of this industry and to ensure the growth of this industry that we keep that in mind that the public perception is always there because we're operating in a public space. And as a footprint of this industry grows in Florida, and we surely hope that it does, public perception is going to be critical statewide to maintaining the uh, resilience of this industry. So I was just going to give a quick overview of our best management practices that relate to environmental protection and just a little bit of a history of how we arrived at those. So uh, nearly three decades ago, the Florida legislature passed the Florida Aquaculture Policy Act. It did several really important things for the state of Florida. Uh, the primary uh, intent of the legislator was to enhance the growth of aquaculture while protecting Florida's environment. It's as simple as that. So uh, it also designated the Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services as a single regulatory agency over aquaculture in the state. That's really important because it, it streamlined uh, the regulatory management. So it defined aquaculture is agriculture. And that seems like a simple statement, but it's absolutely critical for making sure that aquaculture is acknowledged as an agricultural product and they receive all of the benefits in terms of state and federal benefits that come from any other form of farming. 
It also defined what an aquaculture product is. And that doesn't mean just tilapia or catfish, which has been traditional in the United States. It means shellfish, it means aquatic plants, it means ornamental fish, and that's very important. So there's two big components of the Aquaculture Policy Act and that it established our aquaculture certificate of registration. That's our commercial license that you need in the state to produce and sell aquaculture products. But that is the singular license you need as opposed to having to acquire permits from various agencies. It requires annual renewal, of course. It also, we established our aquaculture best management practices. This manual covers regulations and, and rules for all the forms of aquaculture, not just shellfish. So it addresses all of our various industries in the state. And it, unlike a lot of best management practices that are out there in different areas, our, ours are enforced and they are non-optional. So the aquaculture best management practices, as I said already, it really streamlined the regulatory process. Instead of having to talk with five different agencies about different things, you just have to come to the Department of Agriculture now and follow our singular rule book. So that really makes things easier for the folks to follow. As you can see, I'm not gonna read off of this list. This is just an example of the permits that would have been required prior to the division having those best management practices and that license in place. So streamlining this and having the division of aquaculture as a single one-stop source is really good thing and it's allowed the industry to develop better than it has in some other states so our aquaculture best management practices are they ensure environmental protection it's as simple as that these apply to a lot to all of our different farms they we do have periodic unannounced inspections twice a year on all of our aquaculture facilities in the state the inspectors ensure compliance with documentation, sales and receipts. We make sure there's a containment of the animals so, so that it, particularly any kind of uh, non-native species are contained and don't escape into the environment. We wanna make sure that water discharge and effluent is treated properly and there's no effects or impacts the environment. So uh, one important thing is that other uh, laws, whether they be local, state, or federal, are also applied. They don't, it doesn't override anything. For the shellfish industry, a good example is uh, seagrass protection. So we, we don't cite leases over uh, seagrass beds because that's a law and regulation that's in place already. So it doesn't supersede those laws. So just a little bit about the aquaculture in the state of Florida on our, we call sovereignty submerged land leases. That's just the public lands owned by the state of Florida. Our jurisdiction goes out three miles into the ocean. So in order to get a lease, you must obtain permission from the state and then lease that property from the state. To date, we have about 677 active leases on a little bit over 1500 acres. And the division, as I said, we're the one-stop shop. So we oversee the application, execution, and compliance of all the leases in the state. And that's primarily shellfish, but there's also some live rock farmers out there as well. So in looking at our, our process, we assess sites that are proposed for shellfish farmings, and we ensure that they meet all the different requirements of the different federal agencies. We won't go into the details of all that. Uh, we ensure that lease, we administrate the lease permits the state of Florida has a general general programmatic permit, so it allows us to issue leases without you all having to individually be compliant and seek a permit. So it establishes and verifies cultivation requirements to ensure that you're out there producing shellfish and not uh, leasing for some other purpose. And it, we enforce, of course, the best management practices. And then, as we said, as I said already, we do inspections and conduct audits to make sure that we're meeting all those standards. So for the shellfish best management practices that uh, I'll just go over, these are gonna be a little wordy, but these are literally word from word straight out of our best management practices manual. There's four or five that are really particularly uh, address environmental impact issues. So non-natural non materials placed in the water or on a submerged land lease shall be anchored to the bottom. This includes clam bags, cover nets, any gear that's out there is required to be anchored in place so that it doesn't get lost or escape into the environment. All culture materials, cover nets, bags, or other designated markers placed on or in the water shall be clean and free of pollutants. And this is, includes petroleum-based products such as oil or grease or other pollutants. Compounds used as preservatives must also be used in accordance with their labels. So this is ensuring that we're not getting any harmful chemicals or anything like that out into the environment. 
So the bags, cover nets, trays used in the culture operation shall be removed from the water when during all uh, cleaning, maintenance, repair, those kind of things. This is getting at really um, ensuring that uh, the water column isn't uh, turbidity or what we call like messing with the clarity of the water and ensuring that the sediments on the bottom are, are as disturbed as minimally as possible. So during harvest, culture bags and cover nets should be rinsed, cleaned over the grow out area and that allows sediments to remain in the area. Uh, mechanical or hydraulic devices are not allowed to be used to clean submerged structures and hand tools for cleaning shellfish bags and other structures are the preferred method. All right, so the aquaculturist is responsible for the collection and proper disposal of all the bags, cover nets, materials used in culture of shellfish on submerged lands or when such materials are removed during maintenance or harvesting or become dislodged during storm events. So you're essentially, if it's your gear, you're responsible for keeping track of it and make sure and it stays on your farm or that it's retrieved. And the aquaculturist must remove all the works, equipment, structures, improvements from the land, the submerged land lease within 60 days should the lease become expired or you decide to not renew it in the future. And that just means that when, if you decide to stop farming for any reason, that, that farm does not leave a permanent footprint or impact in the environment. Uh, so this one is uh, addressing floating gear particularly. So we require that the leaseholder's identification information is attached to floating gear and off bottom culture structures. And this is to make sure just if it should become dislodged or lost that it can be traced to an individual and assigned and it can be retrieved. This is also a really good thing for the public to see and view gear as a not marine debris or a piece of trash. That's an oyster basket that has value to the farmers and that is something that is it's not just out there in the environment polluting things. This is a commercial gear. It has a purpose, it has an owner, and it can be retrieved. So that's a good thing for public perception of viewing aquaculture from the outside. So in the event that floating or off-bottom culture structures become dislodged from the lease site, it's the leaseholder's responsibility to retrieve those structures from the shoreline, seagrass bed, submerged bottom with minimal damage to the resources affected. All right, and the structure shall be removed and properly disposed and returned to the lease site. So those are our basic uh, environmental protection shellfish laws. Um, does anybody have any questions about any of those? Yes. Oh, hold on one second. We'll get the microphone to you. And I guess the, I, go, I cover all these. Let's everybody try to keep those in mind as we go through the panel sessions today. So just a quick question about the removal aspect. You said within 60 days, mm -hmm. um, they have to remove it. Do you have any sort of an assurance bond if they don't clean up? Do they have to post something um, or have some sort of a, a bond available um, so you guys want to be held responsible for cleaning it up yourself? We do not require any financial bonds or anything okay. to be put in place. So okay. I'm aware some other states do that. But. Yeah, have you ever had an issue with, with that where someone basically abandons the lease and then you have to go and clean up the equipment? Um, not that I'm aware of, no. Okay. So. Okay. That's mm -hmm. great. Anybody have any other questions? So my question is back to dislodged and floating gear. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've been in the industry for about six years, all up and down the East Coast in New England. Not asking anyone to admit this, but I know most growers don't tag all their items out there. Mm -hmm. It's a cost expense, and if you have you know, one cage with nine bags in it right there, that's about $20 worth of tax. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm sure the state doesn't, when they go out and do those checks, you're not checking every piece of gear. So how do you ensure that, and along with when gear gets dislodged, containing shellfish, nobody's identified it and we don't know where it came from, but it washed ashore or what waterway, so how do you identify that? Well, I guess there's, uh, we had this discussion earlier and this is something that maybe we can discuss more in the oyster panel session, but uh, there's a, it, it, you're right, it is very difficult to tag every single bag. So that, you know, we, we don't, uh, the division doesn't scrutinize exactly how you go about marking that gear. So it's, every bag doesn't need to be marked because they're within a structure like a floating cage. So if that cage itself is marked, I think that suffices. So. 
And then when, say, like a line containing 30 bags gets dislodged and maybe one of those floating bags is tagged or none of them are and there's shellfish in it and then maybe it floats, you know, 20 miles somewhere and washes up in a completely different waterway. How do you identify that and how is removal cleaned up of that shellfish? Uh, that circumstance hasn't come up in Florida quite yet. Um, and, and that's, you know, it's, it's practicality versus what we're trying to achieve by marking the gear. So not, not every, you know, it, it, we understand if not every single piece of bag or, or part of a cage is marked. So it's, it's, I'm going to let uh, Portia Sapp, our assistant director, handle that one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think if, if the gear cannot be identified as to who it belongs to, it'll be collected by either FWC or FDAX. And we're trying to work that out right now because we just had a similar instance. But that's why it, you know, it's really important that the leaseholder marks their gear so that if it does wash up, we can identify who it is and get it back to them. And then we can identify the source, you know, of the seed and everything as well um, versus unidentified gear floating somewhere, you know, that's going to be picked up by FWC or FDAX at this point. Yep, that's exactly what I was going to say. Yeah. Anybody else have any? So I, th I think as a practical matter, and the farmers in the room will confirm this, not everybody does the same thing with their gear. And everyone knows everyone, and they kind of recognize whose gear is where, right? And so I think we should, uh, a lot of gear recovery occurs, and gear is traded back and forth and returned to farmers all the time because there is value in that gear, and that should be recognized as just a, a common practice of, of farming. And I understand that you can have instances where gear gets lost, but it's, it's something that's of value to the farm. People recognize it. It may not have a little clip on every piece, but the way people tie knots, the kind of rope that they use or the kind of clip them and where they put it really distinguishes that gear. And so if we, do we really have to have a fingerprint on every piece? Probably not. So think about that. Oh, so, okay. I'm Paul Zajac. I'm the executive director of the National Aquaculture Association. I happen to have worked with the Florida Department of Ag for quite a while and was involved in some marine debris cleanup here on the island. Does anybody else have any other questions to add? Okay. Well, we'll move into our, uh, our panel sessions now. Dr. Bill Walton's gonna come up and give a quick talk, introduce our special uh, guest speaker, farmers, and then I'll let him lead that. All right, am I supposed to use the mic? Nope. Use that. I think, yeah. This one's for you, those are for the participants. Thank you. All right. Hey, uh, Reed and Jeff, you wanna come on up? So first, uh, I'm, I'm Bill Walton. I'm with uh, Auburn University Shellfish Lab, um, also with uh, Mississippi Alabama Sea Grant. And I've been joined today by uh, Jeff and Reed Tilly, who are with the Oyster Boss. Um, they're going to be on the panel. Danita Sasser is not able to make it today. She said uh, she may be online, uh, but she said uh, she had a cold that she did not want to spread to this room. So I uh, apologize, but I'm pretty confident that Jeff and Reed have a, a lot of experience to share. Um, one of the things. You know, I've worked with uh, shellfish farmers on the East Coast, but here in the Gulf Coast, it's, it's relatively new. But I, one thing I want to emphasize is that, in my experience, shellfish farmers are stewards of the environment. I don't want to step on Skid's, Skid's session here, but to me, um, it's good practice for an oyster farmer or shellfish farmer 
to be taking care of their gear and it's good business. Um, and so, you know, we just mentioned the oysters, you don't want to lose the oysters and you certainly don't want to lose that cage that you paid a lot of money for. So I do think that aquaculturists are highly motivated to manage their gear well. So uh, I certainly understand that marine debris is a problem, but I actually think that aquaculture, uh, aquaculturists can be part of the solution. So uh, when we look at oyster farming gear, um, I, I break it into three types of containers that we typically would use. A suspended system, something where you are setting the height of the gear, so it's on some type of long line that you're deciding is that high up in the water column, low in the water column, or out of the water. Um, floating gear, and there's a lot of variations on that. You can have floating bags, you can have floating cages, you can have floating platforms. There's a lot of options for that. And then, uh, is anybody here using any type of bottom gear? Anything that sits on the bottom? I confusingly call this off-bottom oyster farming because the oysters are off the bottom. The cage is on the bottom. Um, but I've heard some other names for this type of stuff like cage culture and containerized culture. None of that sounds good to me. Like it's off bottom oyster farming because uh, you're getting the oyster up off the bottom. So for any of those types of gears, those are essentially the ones I wanted to think about what you do. If, does anybody have a different type of gear that we should be talking about? So when I think about best management practices, I think that there's a, um, a lot of good advice out there about how you should clean up the environment. Um, the East Coast Shellfish Growers does uh, publish a best management practices guide. And they include managing your gear. That is one of the things that they, that they suggest. The first thing I would say is never, never, never skimp on your anchoring or your mooring. Um, that's what's going to keep your stuff there. I don't care if it's pilings or if it's screw anchors, but um, uh, buy a larger anchor than you think you need um, for that site. Um, you can test those and you can and see how much they hold. Um, but I would always overbuy on those because, as we've talked about at lunch, um, the weather is going to be worse at, at some point than you expected it could ever get. And so um, I spend a lot of money for all the stuff we do at Auburn. We get the biggest anchors that, that we can afford. And we use, um, I think we're now using three quarter inch main line for our cages, if not one inch line, just to hold that stuff there. Um, the uh, reducing and managing chafing, um, you know, chafing is, is nobody's friend under any circumstances, right? Um, <laughs> nobody's ever said, I wish I chafed more. Um, so, you know, you do, uh, this is one of these things, I've had a couple of engineers tell me that um, if you put, uh, it, you can have a steel cable, and then if you put a plastic hook on that, that um, to dislike material, un unlike materials, you will find out which one is the weaker material pretty quickly. Um, and it turns out that it'll saw through your plastic um, because the metal was, it was rubbing on it. So um, you want to manage all that chafing. You don't want rub points. You want to find all those and you want to reduce those. And you want to either tighten them up so they can't move or you want to uh, have like-on-like -like materials. So tag gear. I struggle with this because tags are expensive. Um, but I will say, uh, I do think there is public perception that if you're willing to put your name on your gear, that it says to people that you're going to be responsible for it. But I also think we do have occasions where my gear breaks away. I would like my gear back. And I would like to think that all my friends out there would recognize my cage and bring it to me. But some of my friends will look at gear and say, oh, there's no name on it. And that's a nice cage. And I can take it because there's no name on it. Um, so it is a little bit of protection for the farmer to do it. I know there's an expense. But I don't know. Do you guys have like crab trap? Uh, anybody have any like those plastic ones? What do those go for now? What do they charge for those? 50 cents? So I wouldn't want to put it on every bag, but certainly if I bought like one of those big cages, I'd like to, I'd like to invest 50 cents in it maybe to, to have that. I like that. I know not everybody does, but I like the idea of tagging my stuff. The biggest thing I've seen with floating gear is all these folks sell you gear, um, and the gear, they'll tell you how it'll ride all sorts of storms, and it can do all sorts of stuff, and then we put three times as many oysters in that gear as they said we should um, now that might be partly because some gear suppliers will tell you you can put more oysters in there than you can. I've seen that too because the, the math works out that the gear looks a lot more affordable if they tell you you can put uh, 250 oysters per bag instead of 175. Um, so I think a little bit of this is on gear suppliers and what their experience has been with stocking oysters other places. My experience with Gulf oysters is we have heavy, heavy oysters. And so 
if I put 250 oysters in one of my bags, I break the bag. The bag, the bag, or if I put that, if I put 250 oysters in a bag and I put six of those bags in there, I am challenging that oyster, that floating oyster cage to continue to float the way it's supposed to. And it certainly doesn't dry the way I want to when I flip it up. So I find that if I overstock the gear, the gear doesn't behave the way it was intended to because it wasn't built to do that. Um, and that's not just the floating gear. I found that with the suspended gear as well. So I know the gear is expensive, but I do think that I would scale my gear so that I'm not overloading it. I think that's one of the reasons that you see failures in the gear sometimes. Um, look, the, if you have a thousand cages in the water, um, a couple cages are going to get away. If 1% of those cages get away, uh, that's a number that's going to show up. People are going to see that. So that's a pretty good record if 99% of your cages don't float away. But the 1% that do, I think having a periodic beach shoreline cleanup like you guys are doing here, I think is a good idea. Show the public, we did that when I was in Massachusetts, the aquaculture community came together and very publicly went out and did a cleanup. We also went to some effort to weigh the aquaculture debris versus all the other debris to show that the aquaculture debris was a pretty small fraction of the stuff that we could find out there. Um, it, like, Aquaculture debris is highly visible, but there is a lot of other stuff out there. Um, and then proper disposal of gear at the end of the useful life. Just being a responsible partner, and when something's time to retire, take it out and, and take it out of service. Yeah. So, and this was, and that unfortunately was a couple of days ago, I probably put that together. So what do we do for storm preparation? Because that is a reality of, of oyster aquaculture. And I know you guys will probably talk a little bit about some experience with storms. Um, I hate, I hate writing stuff down, but I do think that if I had a farm, I would think about having a plan and I'd actually think about forcing myself to write it down because what I have found is that that storm's wobbling around out there. You're in the cone of uncertainty and there's a lot of decisions that you're making about family, about your farm. Is it going to be on the good side of the storm, the bad side of the storm? I guess the better side of the storm, the bad side of the storm. But you're making a lot of choices, and it is very difficult doing that. We had a lot of people calling when we had a couple storms come through last year. Hey, what are you doing? What, are you guys going to sink? Are you gonna, what are you going to do? I would actually start to have a plan with tiers. And I've got a couple farmers over in Alabama. They look at the storm surge projections, and based on the storm surge and which way the storm is coming from, they decide if they're going to float or going to sink. And they sort of break that down, and they think about how many days out. And I wish, I wish I could tell you that I would wait to 48 hours, but typically our farmers are making the decision about three days before a storm hits. Because if I've got Florence or the next storm after it that's coming down the barrel, I've got to take care of my kids and my home. And so my farm, I have to make the decision a day before. The downside of that is we've been in the cone and based on three days out, we've made decisions to sink cages and then thankfully the storm went a different direction. So I made a lot of work for myself because I sunk a bunch of cages that I now have to go get back up off the bottom. But you have to, we just have to think about how much time we have to sink these cages. So again, another thing I hate to do is make work for myself, but we found, and I just saw a bunch of buddies in the Carolinas on, on Facebook and social media showing pictures of going out and sinking their stuff. It takes longer than you think. Um, that is, it turns out that getting those cages down is not a simple process, especially once the wave chop has started, it's gotten windy. So I would actually, I wouldn't sink all my cages on my farm, but I would have my crew, because you get new people every year, I'd have a day where we went out, and maybe it's not the best day of the year, we go out and we would practice sinking a line of cages, and I would time us just to see how long it actually takes. Um, we always do this. We'll always get a lot of evaluating the risk. What is the wind speed? What is the direction? What is the surge? And, and having decisions based on that. Um, prepare your land-based operations. We had a big storm come through that turned out not to do any damage to the farms themselves. The farmers, the gear rode the storm very well. This, what happened was a surge came up and everybody's stuff that was on land that was too low lying got like a bunch of floated, empty baskets that they had got carried up and floated and we had to go pick them up and bring them back. Was, we made a lot of work for that. So having your land-based operations prepared, and like I said, time yourself, know what you realistically can do. And I think, you know, some of this floating gear, if you're gonna move it, if you're gonna sink it, you've got other things to do. 
how many people are going to be available to you and your farm and how many cages, how many bags, what can, what can you actually do in the time that you have? Um, for floating gear, I'll share that. Do we share these later? Because I know I don't want to bore people with details. Will these be available? These presentations, Charlie? Okay. All right. Basically, you know, this is pretty common. Like you check your knots, check your lines. You might need to put slack in your lines for floating gear if, if your tidal surge is predicted to be high. Um, if you decide it's going to be really bad, you're going to decide to sink stuff. Um, check your cage doors, uh, your floats and caps, check that they're in good condition. As I mentioned, make sure your bags are not overstocked. If you're going to sink cages, these ones that have these pontoons, just make sure they're down so that they're on the floats. We talked about this. Do you go get a, some people want to go get their stuff and take it out of the water. I just, um, you guys have seen hurricanes and you know what they can do. If a hurricane comes through, how long can you keep your oysters cold and damp in a reefer and how long will it be before they're back in the water? And my preference would be to keep them on site. And if I'm going to keep them on site, I want to keep them in the best position to survive out there. Um, this is a tough one. If you're going to sink cages, you might want to consider returning the caps to prevent the floats. So in Canada, where they've invented some of this gear, they're in 10 foot of water, and it's Canada, so the water's cold. So when they sink their cages, they just let them go to the bottom and they leave the caps off. And they pull those up and they rinse them out. We've tried that, and if we have any sand, we have had, like with some of the storms, those floats become giant sandbags. Um, and I'll pull my cages apart trying to get them out, unless somebody's in the water, actually two people were, we were actually jiggling the cages back out of the sand to do it. It was a tremendous amount of work. So I would now spend the time to dive back down and put the caps back on. Uh, but that adds time to your, to your process. For suspended gear, something like these long lines, you really want to check your pilings, um, uh, make sure that all the lines are secure. Your basket doors, you want to make sure they're closed. Uh, make sure that the baskets are correctly clipped. Don't overstock. And then, of course, you, what you would do here is if your baskets are normally up here, you're taking your baskets down as close to the bottom as you can. And you're, you're basically hoping that the pilings stay and the lines hold and that you're out, out of the wind wave action. Um, so my tips would have a plan for recovery of your gear after the storm. How are you going to get these cages back up became a, a big issue. Be ready to do cleanup and, of course, recognize that you may have other priorities like your roof uh, on your house maybe out. Can you show that video? I was just up in Prince Edward Island. This is a, a gentleman up there. He was just showing some of the mechanics. Uh, we have done this with a davit and just hand powered this, but he's got some hydraulics on his boat to do it. He was just showing if they were um, pulling the cages, he has it on board right now, but he was just showing me how he could lift the cage up with the arm and then you could let the water drain out if they had been underwater and then you could recap them. So imagine that this was coming up from the bottom first and so he'd pull it straight up, let the water drain out, and then he would reach underneath the cage, put the caps on, and, and cap it and let it float again. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not a minor amount of work, but it's a doable amount of work. I think actually, I think I said questions on this, but before I take questions, I think what I wanna do is actually first just introduce Reed and Jeff and have you guys, could you just, do you guys have a microphone? Uh, if you guys, if uh, you guys are at Oyster Boss, could you talk a little bit about your farm and what, you know, where you're situated? I've got some Oprah Winfrey style questions to throw at you after that, but. Um, you guys could just introduce your situation. Uh, thank you, Bill. Uh, my name is Reed Tilly. I'm with Oyster Boss. I've been farming for about three and a half, four years uh, up in the Panhandle Alligator Point, uh, Alligator Harbor. Um, at first, I started out with SEPA long lines. Uh, just figured out that there wasn't, you, you can't fit enough oysters in one basket to make it really worth it. So we switched to the, to the uh, six bag oyster grow. And uh, they've done uh, very well. Uh, we have about 400, 400 six bag cages in the water right now. Uh, last August, we planted 1.2 uh, million oysters. And uh, we started, uh, you know, uh, harvesting those oysters back in March. And we are continue harvesting those oysters now. And uh, we just planted another 2.5 million oysters uh, about two months ago. So this will be our 2019 season. Um, we've endured a few storms. Um, nothing, nothing, nothing tremendously bad, but, uh, thankfully we have not lost a single cage. And, uh, I, I take that, you know, the reason why we haven't lost a cage is, is because we take the time in putting in, 
uh, the right gear to hold the hold the cages in place. We're using a three quarter inch poly deck rope with a half inch laterals coming up to our oyster grow cages, and um, you know it, it works out tremendously. We're, we're using a four forty eight inch uh, forty eight inch augers with a six inch paddle on the end of it. So you're not you're not pulling those out of the ground. And, um, you know, we have, we've never pulled one out of the ground. We've never bent one. And, um, I just, it's always, you know, worked out really well for us. I wouldn't use another gear, any other gear besides, uh, floating, floating cages. Um, recently we started, uh, messing with Ketchum cages up in Massachusetts and, uh, they've also done, done us very well. And, um, we haven't had any issues with those either. And it's really, uh, you know, the, the cages are basically the same, but it's really how you, you know, how you mount them in the water. And uh, that, that's the that's the key to keeping your gear. Uh, our area, everybody else is, everybody else up there uses um, go deep, you know, with the bullet floats. And there's really not a good way to secure them that I found. And, you know, other farmers, we're always helping other farmers after storms recover their gear off the land. A lot of times their oysters are dead, you know, because you can't find all the cages uh, in a reasonable amount of time. And um, it's unfortunate, you know, we try to help them out, but they lose a lot of, lose a lot of oysters uh, out of the oyster, uh, out of the uh, go deep, go deep float, floating cages. So I'm going to hand it off to Jeff. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so our, um, our own best management practices um, have us tagging everything. Um I actually made a deal with a company that manufactures golf bag tags. I don't know if everybody knows what I'm talking about with that, but that's worked out really well for us, relatively inexpensive. So everything that we have in the water is tagged, uh, and I encourage my fellow ac aquaculturists in the area up there to do likewise. Uh, we have chased a lot of um, a lot of a lot of gear up into the marsh um, with recent storms that we've had up there. Uh, but none of it's been our gear. So fortunately, thanks to my crew here, we are uh, we're, we're batting a thousand on uh, not losing anything, not 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 anything breaking away. But um, uh, what Reed said is very true. It's a huge inefficiency for our fellow growers in uh, Alligator Harbor uh, to have to chase their equipment and chase their oysters down after um, after an event. Uh, and also, I don't think you uh, mentioned this, Bill, but I. I think it's uh, a good timing. Um, so yesterday, I got a phone call from the FWC. That's uh, the Florida Wildlife Commission. Uh, the officers in my neck of the woods had uh, found nine, was it nine or 12? 12, okay. It was 12 of the floating uh, go deep cages uh, in a very strange place where they shouldn't have been. Obviously, they had broken away from somewhere uh, and wound up in, the, uh, in an area where they shouldn't be. Um, and, and it occurred to me that that type of, of, of incident taking place where nothing is tagged and someone's equipment has wound up where it shouldn't be, um, it's, it's just not, it's not a good reflection on the, on the trade, on the industry. One of the things I always think about is if, if we, as business people uh, and as aquaculturists, if we can't control ourselves, the government will help us with that. The government will step in and help us control ourselves. We need to implement best practices to keep that sort of thing from happening. And um, anyway, I advocate for that. Well, one thing I know that uh, some folks had asked me that they were curious about, uh, have you guys found that you've worked with any manufacturers to find solutions for our region? Like a lot, no, very little of the aquaculture gear that we're using here is from here. It's from other places. Have you found any ways to work with some of the manufacturers to help adapt the gear to our conditions? Has there been any back and forth with the manufacturers? Uh, uh, Ketchum, we've worked with Ketchum a little bit and uh, Ketchum has designed a way to, instead of sinking your floats, you can take your floats off the cage, which is very helpful. Uh, you don't have, you know, they're not near as heavy. They're not full of water when you're pulling them back up off the bottom. So, uh, you know, they're detachable, uh, very easy to take off, very easy to put back on. And then all you're doing is lifting the cage with the oysters up out of the water after, uh, you know, after the storm. How'd that come about? You guys talked with them and sort of asked them for a different solution. I mean, what was the way to get to that? Well, they, they basically already had the design and um, we've we kind of uh, helped them out with a little bit of the, the modifications on the, the, 
mounting and dis you know dismounting and mounting the the pontoons back on the cages yeah we brought a nine bag catch em cage with us in the back of the pickup truck when we drove down so um if anybody'd like to take a look at that we'd be happy to show it to you we're just parked right out here where everybody is break after this charlie all right so that'd be a good time if anybody wants to do that so maybe what i'll ask you guys but maybe also because there, there is some experience in the audience here too is you know, without naming names, like what are some of the biggest mistakes that you've seen? I think we can learn from the mistakes of ways to attach things. Um, one of my mistakes was not putting caps back on. Like after I, that piece of advice I gave you, uh, I was over in Mississippi working with some guys there and we were on firm, firm sand. It was not, I, I was confident that we weren't, that, uh, that we weren't going to get buried in the mud. Well, sure enough, the wind worked just right so that every single one of those, when you looked in the side, they were full up to sand halfway across. They had essentially, and I got to be one of the guys who got to help lift those cages back up. And I, I regret it that at the time we decided it wasn't worth the extra time to go dive down to the bottom and screw the tops back on. I will never make that mistake again in my system. Some places they don't do it, but I'm not going to not do that again. So I just was wondering between you guys, is there some way that you used to attach gear, manage your gear that you would never do again? Skid, I don't know if you've got anything you want to throw in, but. Um. So I just want to say that uh, Yager Anchor is the best invention ever. Um, I've got 60 of them on my old farm and, and you can't pull them out with a thousand pound pull straight up. Um, they, they work like a dream and you don't need to uh, have them galvanized if you screw them below the sediment surface because there's no oxygen down there so there's no rust and as far as chafing just put a tight clove on there um, avoid all that um, and then the other consideration you know this has nothing to do with marine debris but if you're in an area where fresh water is going to come in and intrude uh, you can quickly kill a crop especially Oysters in summer have a respiration need, and they can close up for a day or two, but that's about it. And so if they open, if they have to open up to respire, and the seawater is at two parts per thousand, you're going to lose your crop. And I've gotten some calls from people down here who've lost millions, and that's unfortunate. So it can be avoided if you can sink your crop and put them down into the saltier water. Um, just a, a thought that has nothing to do with marine debris, but survival is the other part here. Anything you guys want to add about mistakes, like lessons learned? Again, you don't have to name names. It doesn't have to be you. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if I want to go there. Um, overall, uh, I've seen people, you know, take, uh, you know, clips, certain clips that were actually made for, for a different, you know, kind of cage, take SEPA clips and pot, try to put them on go deep stuff. I, I, I tried that whenever I first got into it and, uh, you know, somehow mounting the SEPA clips in a fashion that, you know, you think they wouldn't come off. And, uh, that was the first time I ever actually put my own seed out and, you know, this is my own mistake, but I've seen a lot of other people do it and they continue to do it. I don't know why, but, um, you know, I, I lost probably a hundred thousand seed and one, and one good little, you know, blow up in the afternoon, little afternoon thunderstorm. So, so, yeah, the recommendation is, is that we shouldn't try to defy the laws of physics. It's just simply not going to work. And uh, we're going to come out on the losing end of that equation. You know, I, I would say one of the things I've seen is with the floating bags, I've seen the attachments. Sometimes people don't spread out the force on that. And I've seen like floating bags at the surface. I'm talking about those square up Vexar bags where you put a couple floats on the top or on the side. I'll see people try to get away with just putting a couple cable ties through one or two holes and, all that bag is going to do all day, every day is bounce on those and it's going to saw through that connection. And I've seen, of course, you don't have to tear much of a hole in the bag to lose a lot of seed out of that. And, and the hole gets bigger and suddenly the bag is loose. So, uh, you know, I've, I would struggle with a floating bag about how you're connecting that and making sure that you're spreading out the force of the attachment. Also, recently we, uh, we, we have uh, 24 lines on each of our leases and uh, 14 cages to a line. And I neglected one of the cages that had a loose cap and it sunk. And, uh, you know, it's covered in barnacles. Uh, you know, the, the tide fluctuates back and forth and uh, also with the wind. But the some of the lateral lines were chafed by that barnacled up cage. So you need to keep all your if you have a if you have gear that is, you know, submerged in the water that doesn't need to be there. Make sure you get it back up in a reasonable amount of time. 
because it will it will chafe your ropes and it's hard to see chafing in your ropes whenever uh, you have all the marine growth barnacles seaweed and all that kind of stuff going on that's a, that's a great point we've worked a lot with the uh, adjustable long line system and so that the way that's designed is you um, there are a couple ways to do it but one of the ways that the the folks in Australia showed us was to put five different clips and then you can clip that line either up high or middle or low well that down low clip ain't in nothing but water and it grows some of the biggest barnacles you've ever seen and so I, it is a problem but sometimes you move that line down and you don't realize that you are taking it across a whole bunch of barnacles and you got to clear that off because you've made a rub point that is is going to chafe if you don't break that off I think I saw a hand up yes that you may not be able to answer for me, but you said that you've lost no cages or hardly any or whatever. And that sounds really good. Around you, there are people that lose gear. And those people, um, and this may be part of your question too, because you talk about a cleanup. How do you get, how do you all feel? Do you who do good practice and don't lose gear, how do you feel about going and helping others pick up their crap? And then how do you um, feel about people who see it? Just how do we get the general rest of the boys in town and girls in town to participate in cleanup when they don't either use the gear or they do it right? How, how do you get that buy-in or do you? Or do you just go, those are those guys over there, and they're idiots. Or do you try to help them? How do you do it before we lose face with the rest of the world? Well, that's a very good question. That's a very good question. Uh, I like to think, think of it as we're all one big family out there on the water. Um, you know, but in reality, you know, people, people, sometimes you know don't always do the right thing uh you know they're hard to get along with you know you see there you know somebody may see your gear floating by and they don't like you and they're not going to stop and pick it up you know but uh we as as a, a company you know we want to you know have a good reputation on the water and i think everybody everybody wants that and uh you know we try to help our fellow aquaculturists in our area um you know we need in, in our area we don't have one but we need a, a a day like saturday but just for the farmers go out and clean the coastline we always get the southeast winds this time of year and all that all that gear is pushed up in the uh, pushed up in the marsh grass it's nobody else's but ours and when i mean ours i'm talking about as a whole and uh, i think we need to create a day uh just just as a as a group of farmers i think we need to create a day to uh you know, get out on a Saturday morning and uh, clean up, you know, clean up our gear. It's hard to get people to switch, uh, switch to another gear, maybe financial, uh, financially uh, can't do it. You know, uh, some gear is cheaper than others. Um, but, you know, it's, it, we can always help, you know, rec recover and return gear. And I'll, I'll always do that no matter, you know, what happens on the water uh, or what kind of relationship I have with the person. So. You know, I, I would. Add, I mean, peer pressure is is uh, only gets you so far. There, if I had a farm, we've got some areas. What do you guys call the high density? High density. We call them oyster farming parks. And so you could have five farms all doing the right thing, and that sixth farm isn't doing something right. So there's one. There's a public perception of debris. There's also a threat to my farm. Because my farm might have ridden that storm out pretty well until your line, not yours, until that line of cages from that farm got loose and now tangles in my stuff. Well, my stuff wasn't designed to anchor my cages and your cages. Like that's where we see a snowball effect. And I want, I want a clean environment too. But let's just put down to dollars and cents. Like from a farmer's point of view, I don't want your gear in my gear. Like I don't want that tangle. I don't want that breakage. I don't want to lose my stuff because I did everything that I was supposed to and then your stuff came through. So we get some peer pressure just from that. Um, you know, with all due respect to the environmental concerns, we'll get some peer pressure of just, you gotta take care of that stuff because you are posing a threat. If that next storm comes through and your stuff gets in mine, I'm coming to your house and talking to you about it. Um, so we get some of that. Um, you can have some of that can be solved with 
aquaculture associations, some of that. I don't know if the, the aquaculture use zones are all managed by the state, right? All right, because we have some of our aquaculture parks are managed by entities. And so those entities can essentially put good neighbor policies on that, that the state might not be able to impose. Um, you know, again, I just think it comes down to good business. Like, unfortunately, it is hard for people if they've made a mistake and they've got a gear that's not working, it's hard for those people to change. But you're throwing good money after bad if you've got the wrong gear out there. And so to me, it would just be trying to encourage them to think about the, the best solutions for that. Uh, I, I just can't imagine growing oysters and having bag after bag after bag float away. I, I, how am I making any money? Um, like there's a, so that, that person has to be motivated to do something different, I would think. Or they go out of business. Right. Right. So, um, with, uh, with hurricanes forming out in the Atlantic, I think it is like, so I want, what are your decision points for storms? Like when, do you decide for you guys, like, what do you do with storms? When is, what are your, what are your tiers of, of action? Do you have a code red? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Say your prayers. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we, we kind of, I kind of got it in my mind and I put it in the, the mind of the guys that uh, work with me on the water is that, uh, you know, uh, personal and family family comes first you know you need to take care of your family and your personal property then you know then we need to get the farm taken care of farm farms last unfortunately it, it will always be last when it comes to your employees uh, it may be your first you know first priority but to them it's not and you got to respect that um, I would I would give it ample amount of time before the storm even if it's coming your way uh, even if the model is a little bit off um, I would, I would, uh, go ahead and, and make your decision, uh, a few days prior. I know, you know, dropping 400 of our cages would just be heartbreaking because I know I got to pick every one of them back up. Um, but having, having the right gear to get those cages back up off the bottom is also important as well. Having a winch on your boat, having a davit, having something that can lift that cage back up off the bottom. You won't do it. You won't lift a six bag cage off the bottom with the brute strength. You can have a couple linebackers on the boat and it still won't happen especially all 400 of them. So um, first and foremost, uh, employees need to be taken care of and then, then the farm. And, uh, you know, I'm thinking four, four or five days ahead of the storm, uh, you know, we need to go ahead and uh, first take an assessment of the gear that we have out there, how many cages we have out, how many sleeves we have out, and uh, then, you know, inspect the gear. And then uh, four days prior to the storm, you know, if it's heading our way, uh, we're going to start dropping, you know, it's what, just what better storm, safe what than sorry. What storm do you drop for? Is it, I mean, a, a category two category, like, is there a standard that you use for that? Well, we, we've waves? been through, a, we've been through a few tropical storms. Um, nothing severe. I'm, I'm, we're, we've had our, I've, I've actually watched from the shoreline four footers yeah. rolling over, rolling over our cages and, uh, you know, they seem to do fine and, um, no lines broke or anything. Uh, there was other aquaculture gear floating by us from other farmers, but you know, we didn't have any issues. So um, I, I don't think that it should be overlooked that a, a part of the best management practice uh, to, is to have a dedicated crew that knows how to do it correctly. They were taught correctly by Doug Ankerson and some of those folks and, uh, and, and maintenance has not escaped our attention. So I would encourage uh, as a part of the BMP, uh, that you're going to have to invest in the maintenance side um, of, of, of the equipment and of the gear. Um, and then when the storms do come, like Reed just said, you can watch the four foot rollers come over the top of your equipment with a lot of confidence that everything's going to make it. And as I said earlier, we are banning a thousand on that, on that issue. And the other thing is, again, let's don't escape tagging the gear. I feel pretty confident that if we do something, it's not going to be uh, it's not going to be a catastrophic loss. We're going to be able to recover it and recover it quickly, hopefully. You know, for me, I think we, uh, just to give you, I mean, Alabama is pretty small. We'll have farms in different parts of the, the coastal waters there make different decisions based on where the storm is coming from, just depending on where they they see their exposure from. So we'll have some farms that decide to sink because of the storm and the, their exposure to that storm, and we'll have others that decide to ride it out. And so far, that again, that's worked out pretty well for them, but it is a case-by-case -case basis. You know, we do get folks who want to call extension and say, you know, what's the what's the advice? And, and we, 
do leave it up to the farmer because it is such a personal decision. Um, and also, if you ask somebody an extension, should I sink or not, we're, we're always going to feel compelled to give you the most conservative answer. Because what if I tell you to not sink and then it gets all wiped away? So if you're asking us, then we almost always have to give you the conservative answer. So um, <laughs> just at some point, there's nothing you can do. I mean, I had 16 foot combers. Uh, my gear was sunk in 17 feet of water. I thought I was safe. I learned a hard lesson that day that uh, forces of nature are, are easily underestimated. I thought I was a smart guy. Um, lost a crop. It shredded pot wire through the cages, the bags up on the beach, and the, the cages that were not shredded were solid blocks of sand because they were a nice quiescent zone where the sand settled out. And uh, you can't lift a solid block of sand with any gear. So I had, to, I had to dive down and jet the sand out of the cages before we could lift them. And by that point, everything was dead. So. You know, the only thing I would add to that is and we thought, of thinking a little bit about that, I mean, there's only so much we can do with built structures on land as well. We have storms come through and we have houses built to code that fail under certain weather conditions. So again, we have farms that can be doing all the right things, but that doesn't mean they're weatherproof. You can't weatherproof. You just build as best as you can and try to prevent that. If something does happen, then the burden is on you to go out and, and, and clean up the mess. Um, that's just, you know, that's the cost of doing business. So. Yes, sir. I think I think the question was about how much does it cost to tag. Uh, our tags, the golf tags that we bought, were roughly sixty cent a piece. Uh, this gentleman right here said about fifty cent a piece. So, uh, basically, for around that price, uh, that's what we paid to tag each gear. So we got four hundred cages. So four hundred. 400 cages times 60 cents basically for per that and that, that'll last longer than a year um those tags you know you could probably get a little bit better tag um uh you gotta watch i would much rather have instead of a printed tag of some kind of uh ink or you know no matter how hard it takes to scratch it off it'll still come off uh you'd really want an imprinted tag or maybe a, a, a raised uh surface kind of like braille or something that, you know, that would last a lot longer. 